I'm Mark Golub. And in the news, a piece in the Jerusalem Post that has relevance to all that's going on on the streets of America and which has created a good deal of controversy, even though the point of the piece is undeniably true. The piece is written by Alan Dershowitz, in which he describes how Black Lives Matter is anti-Israel. Now that should be news to no one. But in the midst of the mass protests over the horrific murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis policeman, Black Lives Matter is now seen by much of America as the champion in the fight against racism in the United States. And anyone who says a word in criticism of Black Lives Matter is branded a bigot and a racist and is subject to becoming a social outcast, even if the criticism is true. I know of not a single Jew who is not horrified by the murder of George Floyd, not a single Jew. I know of not a single Jew who does not feel police brutality must be rooted out of American society. But not every Jew agrees that the goals and tactics of Black Lives Matter are appropriate. In some circles of Jewish life today, any dissent is heresy. Well, for a lifetime of public service, Alan Dershowitz has been a leading voice in support of civil liberties, human rights, and the vision of America as a country committed to the principles of justice and equal opportunity for all. And he has been lauded for decades by the liberal community of America and was recognized and appreciated for being the most eloquent and outspoken voice in defense of the state of Israel. But it's no secret that Allen's principled defense of the rule of law as it applies to the attacks on Donald Trump, a candidate he neither voted for nor supports. Alan Dershowitz has been pilloried and ostracized by his once liberal dear friends and by progressives within the Jewish community. It has not stopped Alan Dershowitz from speaking the truth as he sees it. By the way, that's all he's guilty of speaking the truth as he sees it. Anyone who disagrees with Alan has every and absolute right to challenge him in the arena of ideas and public discourse. But we live in a very different and frightening times. Free speech is under assault from the left, from the liberal community of America, and sadly, tragically, from parts of the liberal Jewish community. And now Alan Dershowitz has dared to speak the truth about Black Lives Matter, which has become a sacred cow in the liberal community. What is Alan's point? It's always my pleasure to have Alan Dershowitz with us on JBS. He joins us now. Alan, thank you so much for making time for us once again on JBS. Well, I'm always happy to make time for you because you present uh, the truth and you speak eloquently about matters of great concern to the Jewish community and to the world at large. So thank you for having me on. By the way, how are you doing, Alan, in this pandemic? We're doing okay. Um, you know, we're away with my family and um, we just take walks and I write every day and uh, try to deal with the realities of the world. I was in Israel with the Prime Minister of Israel when this broke out, and we spent a good deal of time together uh, in which he told me, basically, he was going to close down Israel. In fact, my daughter was supposed to meet us in Israel, and she and her fiancé were not allowed to come into the country in the earliest days of the pandemic, and Israel was, of course, ranked first country in the world. In dealing with this, it's now been demoted to third because they've opened schools and 
uh, the the illness has spread, but Israel did a great job, and I was there when 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 it happened. We're back at home, and uh, and we're trying our best to to cover. Very good. By the way, when you were in Israel and Netanyahu closed down planes flying into Israel, was he called xenophobic? He was attacked, of course, by people on the hard left who hate him, no matter what he does. And uh, but his um, uh, he was widely supported, and he, he was seen as a hero of of efforts to try to prevent the virus from spreading around the country. Alan, you have a new book, Guilt by Accusation. What's it about? Well, I was falsely accused by a woman I never met uh, of having sex with her when she was, I don't know, 18 years old. I've never had sex with an 18-year-old. I've never had sex with anybody other than my wife since the day I met Jeffrey Epstein, so I wrote a book about it. Then Netflix put on a series uh, filled with lies, using the woman who accused me as the main source without disclosing the fact that she had, she had sent emails admitting she never met me. She wrote a book manuscript admitting she never met me. Uh, her lawyer on tape says she was wrong, simply wrong. She couldn't have possibly met me in the places she said she met me. An FBI investigation, the former director of the FBI, concluded the charges against me were false. Her best friend said she told her she was pressured into falsely accusing me for money by her lawyers, notwithstanding that Netflix didn't put any of that on the air. They just put the accusation on the air. So I'm suing Netflix. I'm busy suing people. Is it 81 years old? I never thought <laughs> I'd be suing people, but here I am suing Netflix. Um, you were not included I, in the Netflix series? I was, but they just had me denying it, uh, but without giving the evidence. I had given them all the evidence. It's all in my book, Guilt by Accusation. Every single document, the emails, the manuscript, the tape from the her lawyer, her other lawyer saying she wasn't telling the truth about Leslie Wexner and other people, but none of that was included. Um, another woman was put on Netflix who claimed and didn't claim anything about me on the Netflix series, uh, but they relied on her credibility. And this is a woman who claimed she had sex tapes with Hillary Clinton and, and Donald Trump and that Hillary Clinton was trying to kill her uh, through the CIA and that she was trying to get help from the KGB. They had all this information, but instead they just put this woman on as a credible woman, never mentioning all this information that proves that she is a chronic liar. Alan, you know, there are all kinds of rumors and statements about what you did or didn't do in, in trying to defend yourself against this case. And there's no secret. I've been sympathetic to you. I find this outrageous. But there are those who are saying you have made a financial payment to make this go away. Is there any truth to that? No, oh, absolutely false. Absolutely, categorically false. I never would, I never have, I never did, I never will. Um, I sued her um, and I'm not gonna settle the case because I want her in prison. She and committed why, perjury. Why has now, the case been resurrected? Because of the Me Too movement. And so it was over, the case was over. The lawyers who brought it dismissed it. They said it was a mistake to file it. Uh, the judge dismissed it. Um, it was over. And then came the Me Too movement and the Netflix series and an article in the Miami Herald. And so she figured there was a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, I'm not in this for the money. Any money I make from the lawsuit, I will contribute to Olive and other great organizations that defend people around the country. I'm just looking to prove, and I have already done it without any doubt, that this is a woman with a long history of lying. I urge anybody, just read my book. You can get it free on Kindle. It's not, I'm not charging anything. I'm not trying to make any money. Read my book on Kindle, and you'll see you will have no doubt that the accusation was made up, totally made up, by a woman who has a long history of lying. She also accused Ehud Barak of having sex with her. She accused Leslie Wexner. She accused Senator George Mitchell. She accused uh, uh, Bill Richardson, a former ambassador to the UN. She accused Marvin Minsky, the man who invented artificial intelligence. She's accused virtually everybody. And the other woman accused Hillary Clinton and Richard Branson and, and, and Donald Trump and Bill Clinton. These are people who just make up stories for money and yet the media is prepared to rely on their credibility in order to make money for themselves. Have any of those who, again, 
pilloried you and made you a social outcast because you dared to speak about principles applying to the presidency, whoever the president was, but it happened to be Donald Trump. Right. Now that, you know, uh, Rob Rosenstein, uh, Rosenstein's testimony has come out and it's, it's now become clear that the charges against Donald Trump were fabricated and that he never was a Russian agent, blah, blah, blah. Have any of the people who once were your friends said to you, Alan, we're sorry, and we, we made a mistake? No, no, they weren't. It was never about that. It was never about my defense of the Constitution. It was always about me being a traitor to the left because I was prepared to use the Constitution in defense of uh, President Trump. You know, the original title for my book was The Case Against Impeaching Hillary Clinton because I wrote it in 2016 when it looked like Clinton would be elected and she would be impeached. And so I, make, I gathered all the constitutional arguments against impeachment. And when he got elected, I just changed the title and changed a few sentences and paragraphs here and there. But the argument was essentially the same. The argument I made in the Senate was exactly the same argument I would have made had Hillary Clinton been president and had she been impeached by Republicans. Okay, Alan, what's your, what point are you making in your Jerusalem Post piece? Well, the point I'm making is that Black Lives Matter is a great uh, cause. Uh, we care deeply about Black Lives. I've been fighting for Black Lives since I was a young man. Um, I went south. I argued in the civil rights movement. Uh, I argued on behalf of uh, death row inmates who are African-American. I have a long history of opposing police abuse of African-Americans. Um, but Black Lives Matter in its platform in 2016 uh, accused Israel of genocide against the Palestinian people and of apartheid. The only country mentioned in its platform, uh, Syria isn't mentioned, Hamas isn't mentioned, South American countries, Philippines that have police abuse all over, never mentioned just Israel. It was an anti-Semitic, in addition to anti-Zionist platform, and I called them out on it. First in 2016, in a liberal newspaper, the Boston Globe, in a widely circulated article urging Black Lives Matter to change their platform. And now when these demonstrations uh, came, and I support the demonstrations, I support the protests against uh, police abuse, many of the protests turned to anti-Israel activities. Uh, they painted pictures of the man who was killed wearing a keffiyeh. Um, they talked about Black Lives Matter as urging um, uh, divestment against um, Israel, false claims that Israel trained the Minneapolis policemen who um, killed uh, um, George Floyd, all of them false. And so I decided to invoke the, the phrase of Hillel, im ain anili mili, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? But if I am for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, when? And I use that in my uh, article. Uh, I am for black lives uh, being preserved and against police who abuse it, but I'm for myself as well and for the Jewish community. And I think it's very important to emphasize that the hijacking of these legitimate protests by the anti-Israel cause is hurting Black Lives Matter, is hurting the cause, and is hurting Jews. So it's a lose-lose, and I wish they would stop hijacking a legitimate protest and turning it against Israel. You heard my open. What do you think is behind the the attempt to, you know, vilify you for making again what I feel is an obviously true statement? What what's happening in not only in America in general, but within elements of our Jewish community that would prompt this kind of criticism of you? Well, you have to pick sides today. And if you pick the side of Black Lives Matter, then you can't say anything critical of them. Look, there are some people on the Israel side who say the same thing. If you pick the side of Israel, you can't be critical of Israel. I am critical of certain Israel activities, and I will continue to be critical when an Israeli soldier shoots a Palestinian who is mentally disturbed. Uh, everybody criticized that from the prime minister down, and there'll be an investigation. The difference is that in Israel, when something like that happens, there is a thorough investigation and there are prosecutions when prosecutions are, are warranted. But today in America, you have to pick sides. And 
if you're seen as uh, pro-Trump, even though I'm a liberal Democrat who supported Hillary Clinton, if you're seen as helping Trump, you're vilified. If you're seeing as criticizing Black Lives Matter, you're criticized. There's no room for nuance. There's no room for calibration. Mm -hmm. I've lived my life on nuance mm -hmm. and trying to strike the appropriate balance. I've lived my life by imposing on myself and on others what I call the shoe on the other foot test. Uh, ask yourself how you would react if the shoe were on the other foot, if it were mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton who were being mm -hmm. impeached, mm -hmm. or if it were uh, you know Jews who were being uh, attacked by police, as they were, of course, in, in Germany in the 1930s and 1940s. So we always have to put ourselves in the position of others. And when you do that, everything turns gray. It's very rare that you see anything that's absolutely uh, black and white. Now, the issue of police abuse is not a gray area. There should, no be, there should be zero tolerance for police abuse, but Black Lives Matter and other organizations on the hard, hard, hard left shouldn't be turning these protests uh, into uh, hijacked protests against Israel, against the Jewish people, um, and uh, that has to stop. Uh, you know, the fact that there were graffiti on synagogues in Los Angeles, pro-Palestinian, anti-Israel graffiti, there's no excuse for that. Jews were not responsible. Israel is not responsible for what happened in Minneapolis. Let's focus on the real issue, and I'm yes. going to continue doing that whether the 92nd Street Y invites me to speak or not, they are the real villain here because they're the ones who deplatform me. They're the ones who wouldn't allow me to speak about a book I wrote in defense of Israel because even though they admitted that I hadn't done anything wrong, well, they didn't want any trouble. They didn't want any controversy. Other than Elie Wiesel, I was the most popular and most frequent speaker in the 92nd Street Y, and now they've turned against me, as have other Jewish organizations, which want to see what side you're on. They don't want nuance. They don't want discussion. They don't want pilpul. They don't want Talmudic discussions. They don't want anything to end up teku. They want to know what the right side is, and the right side is Black Lives Matter, even if they're anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. Uh, You've dealt with the police over a lifetime of, of legal work. Would you say that the police Department of America, the, the police establishment of America, is systemically racist? Far less than they used to be. Um, there used to be a lot of racism, particularly in the South, by police. Um, uh, today, I think there's much, much less of it. Look, I grew up being very friendly with the police athletic league a few blocks away from where I lived. Uh, we had great relationships with the police in our in our neighborhood, um, most of the police in our neighborhood were, were Catholic. They were either Irish or Italian, and we were Jewish kids. So we got along fantastically. Uh, in my experience with the police, and I've had a lot of experience cross-examining them, criticizing them, sometimes even making formal complaints against them, the vast, vast majority of police are very, very decent people who want to do the right thing and want to come home to their families safely. Same thing is true with the FBI. You know, when I was threatened with being killed by a neo-Nazi some years ago, the FBI notified me and sent me two agents to spend weeks with me. Um, we became friends. They came to my classes. They went with me to Celtics basketball games. Uh, they were great guys. Um, but there have been people in the FBI, individual agents who have been rogue agents, and there have been individual policemen who have done terrible, terrible things. But that's okay. true of the profession. Uh, okay, but wait, that seems to me to be so realistic. There are bad apples. There mm -hmm. are bad cops. By the way, there are bad lawyers. Oh, absolutely. There, yeah, there, are, bad doc there yeah. are bad doctors. Yeah. There are bad people. Who, and there are bad journalists. There are very there bad are, uh, journalists. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And there are bad editors of newspapers um, that fire people for printing op-eds that they disagree with. Isn't uh, there are bad terrible? people in every profession. Isn't that terrible, by the terrible. way? Terrible. Terrible. Um, you know, I mentioned the attack on free speech is the most frightening thing to me, Alan. I agree. It's free speech is being attacked primarily today from the hard left. When I was growing up, it was attacked from the hard right, McCarthyism. Uh, I defended professors and other students from attacks based on um, attacks on uh, 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 from the hard right. Today, most of the attacks on free speech comes from the hard, hard left. Look, yes. the hard, hard right, the neo-Nazi white supremacist hard right uh, is, 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 if anything, worse in many ways because they use 
physical violence and and they kill people in synagogues. So uh, we have to oppose both the hard right and the hard left. In fact, I have a new book coming out next week called The Case for Liberalism in an Age of Extremism or Why I Left the Left but Couldn't Join the Right, in which I make the case for free speech, for civil liberties, for due process, for a centrist approach to politics in America rather than the extremism that we're seeing in a good deal of my attack on the hard left is about censorship on university campuses and now on major American newspapers. Okay. I asked you about the police department. The argument being made by Black Lives Matter and by those who are protesting throughout America is that America itself is systemically racist and therefore the system has to be maybe even torn down and you know and changed to what extent when you hear people say america is systemically racist to what extent do you say to yourself yeah that's true or that's an extreme statement that goes beyond the truth and again you need nuance america was established on racist principles Obviously, the Constitution of the United States included racist elements, uh, slavery, uh, African-Americans being counted as a percentage of who they were, Jim Crow laws, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, almost the beginning of the 20th century. We've had a long history of racism, but that yeah, but doesn't mean we're systemically racist today. We yes. elected an African-American president twice with overwhelming majorities of white voters. And um, I don't think race today uh, is a factor in university uh, education, except perhaps in, in a positive uh, way. So we live in a mixed society in which there are still residues of racism or elements of racism or aspects of racism in certain parts of society. But to say America is a racist society without saying that the same kind of racism affects virtually every other country in the world is to demonize the United States. Look, more black people want to come to America than want to come to any other country. People vote with their feet. Um, uh, visas are sought from black African countries to come to America, not to go to uh, other countries in the world. And so I think it's, it's a bad rap to accuse America in general of systemic racism. And then to focus on Jews or Israel, which is what happens often, that you know, we're the white privileged people, we're Jewish and we're privileged. I didn't grow up with any privilege. I don't know about you, but I grew up being turned down by 32 out of 32 Wall Street firms, even wow. though I was first in my class and editor in chief of the Yale Law Journal. I grew up knowing that I couldn't work for various companies. I grew up knowing I couldn't live in various uh, neighborhoods of, of New York. I grew up knowing I couldn't get a condo uh, in, in the Upper East Side in the building I now live in. Uh, which has changed. Uh, obviously, anti-Semitism has been reduced, but I didn't grow up with any privilege. My grandparents who came from Poland didn't come with privilege. Um, privilege is, uh, in the end, deep down, a bigoted concept. What you says of the violence that's also been part of, and I, I'm not seeing in any way that the peaceful protesters were responsible, but we have seen violence to the extent that major cities across the country had to impose curfews. Mm -hmm. that, is it, that isn't done if there are three or four people uh, being violent. That is in response to serious mob violence. What's your sense of it? Whenever you get demonstrations, you get people from the hard right and people from the hard left who want to see violence because violence is the key to revolution. And remember, there are people on both sides of the political spectrum who want to see revolution. There are people on the extreme white, white supremacist side who say we want to end our country. There's too much uh, influence of, of black people, uh, people of color, of Jews. So we see violence from the hard right. We see violence from some on the hard left. The vast majority of protesters are nonviolent. And, you know, there are three kinds of protesters. There are those who engage in completely constitutionally protected speech, signs, etc. They have to be protected and defended. Then there are those who destroy property but not attack people. Uh, that, I think, is not acceptable in America today, but it's not as bad as those who would attack people. For me, the shock 
was to see two lawyers, young lawyers, one of them from a big law firm that apparently threw a Molotov cocktail into a police car. Now that police car was empty, but there were others who threw explosives into police cars with police either in them or around them. The idea, remember, this is not new. This happened in the 70s when radicals on the hard left, the weathermen and others, were trying to attack American soldiers in Fort Dix, trying to attack American universities, uh, explosives at the University of Wisconsin, people killed, and then the police responding by killing innocent people at Kent State. There's too much violence. And whenever we see legitimate demonstrations, we see violence. But I want to contrast that with what happened when Martin Luther King was conducting demonstrations. He was so clear that violence would be forbidden. I was at those demonstrations. I was at Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. I have to make an admission here. It was the first time I went to an event on Shabbos because I was a completely observant Orthodox Jew. I stayed in Washington, D.C. at a friend's house so I could walk two miles to be there to hear Martin Luther King and we were told by, I was a law clerk at those days, and I was, we were told by the Chief Justice not to go to the Martin Luther King speech because there was a fear that violence would break out and we might be witnesses, even though we were members of the judiciary. There was no violence. It was peaceful because Martin Luther King was a man of peace. He projected peacefulness. And I wish some of the leaders today would follow Martin Luther King's lead. And he was criticized by the Black Panthers, by Malcolm X, by others within the African-American community as being too peaceful, as being unwilling to use violence. He believed in the notion of you show the world that you're the victim of violence and the world will support you. And he was right when they used dogs and hoses on him and others in the South. He didn't respond with violence and he is a role model and he also was a Zionist. He attacked those who would criticize Israel and said, you're attacking Israel, you're attacking Jews. It's anti-Semitism. I wish people would really take to heart the lessons of Martin Luther King. Oh, you say that so beautifully. I, I, I am with you 100%. By the way, in only a minute, do you have any feelings about the attempt to throw Mort Klein and the ZOA out of the president's conference because he called Black Lives anti-Semitic? Black Lives has elements of anti-Semitism. The Black Lives platform of 2016 is anti-Semitic. So if yes, you're going to throw I'm Mort Klein just, out, they yeah. should throw me out because I stand behind him. Look, Mort and I disagree about so many things. We disagree about the West Bank. We disagree about occupation. We disagree about the two-state solution. But the idea of throwing the president of a very important Zionist organization out because he may have said something we disagree with or you disagree with. He may have overgeneralized. Um, uh, Black Lives Matter contains m m vast majority of people who are not anti-Semitic, who are not anti-Israel. Um, but uh, the platform itself, the 2016 platform, was anti-Semitic. And you can't say that calling the nation state of the Jewish people genocidal and apartheid, you can't say that's just anti-Zionist. That's anti-Semitic to single out the nation state of the Jewish people for the worst false accusation imaginable, genocide, a term coined, to describe the destruction of the Jewish people is anti-Semitic. So if there is an attempt to throw a Mort Klein, I will defend him politically. And if necessary, I will defend him legally. I will stand behind his right of free speech, even though I disagree perhaps with the way he put it. Alan, it is always so wonderful that you give us time. You know, I just want you to keep fighting the good fight. All you've ever done is try to tell the truth as you see it. I fear for America that would not allow the kind of freedom of thought and the freedom of speech that you express. And at one time, Alan, you and I would have been livid if it had ever been done in the opposite direction. So, so it would be. Called Tu Vahatzlacha to you. Great. Uh, you'll come out with your new book, yeah. Alan. You and I will talk about it. Anyway, okay. you be well, stay safe, and we'll see you very soon. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You be well. The thoughts of Alan Dershowitz and his piece on Black Lives Matter is in the Jerusalem Post. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Stay safe and be well, my friends. Mm -hmm.